Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our call. There'll be a lot more folks joining us, so we'll give a, a few more minutes just for some of the late arrivals to join. But in the meantime, my name is Kazu Haga. I'm the founder and core member of the East Point Peace Academy and want to welcome everyone to our call. Um, just as we uh, wait for a few more minutes for others to join us, I'd love to invite everyone into the chat box um, on Zoom. You should see a chat button at the bottom of your menu. If you just click on that, you have the ability to send a chat and just share with us where you're calling in from. I know we have folks calling in from all over the country and all over the world um, and would be curious to see where people are calling from. So I see Mary calling in from San Diego, uh, Martha from Iowa, Portland, Oregon. Peter, sending you lots of thoughts with everything that's been happening in Portland recently. Some more local folks to me. I'm calling from the San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, give me one second. Folks from Florida, wondering if anyone is calling in from outside Worcester, Mass. All right, I grew up in uh, Western Massachusetts myself, so welcome, Alana. Vegas, North Carolina, Florida, Australia. All right, I, Australia is amongst my favorite places in the world. I've been three times, so welcome. I don't know what time it is over there, but thank you for your commitment to be here. Um, See folks from Santa Cruz. Hey friends, we're in here. Just really sweet seeing uh, seeing where everyone's calling in from. Wow, all over the states, east, west, middle America, down in Brazil, Texas, Michigan, Minnesota. Awesome, really, really honored to be here with all of you. Arizona, New York, Washington, Alaska, Australia. Wow, what time is it over there, Alistair? I see that Hawaii. it's 1 p.m. on Wednesday in New Zealand. So Home state of Jersey, Garden time. State. New Mexico, Northern Canada. Where are you, Patricia? DC, Oregon, wonderful. I see someone from Northampton, Massachusetts also, where I spent uh, probably about 15 years of my life, so. Grand hello. Prairie, Alberta. All right. I think we'll get started in a few minutes. Kazu is gonna welcome all of us and orient us, but just uh, really sweet to see this. Yeah, really grateful to have so many folks here from all over the world. Curious as we maybe give another three minutes or so for people to arrive. If you want to share, you know, it's, a, it's been a crazy year, as we know, lots of things going on in the world, but what's one inspiring thing that you've seen or that uh, you've experienced recently? I um, would love to hear some stories. I'm also getting some questions about the recording. Uh, the call will be recorded. Um, and it usually takes us a couple of days just to edit the video and send it out to everyone, but everyone who registered um, we'll receive a link in your email with the call recording. So don't worry about that. Um, I see people saying you've been able to deepen your meditation practice, Stephanie, um, myself as well. Nature is blossoming all around. Indeed, that is definitely the case. More self-care. Family having more time together, having courageous conversations has definitely been a theme in my life as well. Intimacy with close friends. It's been fun trying to find creative ways to build that intimacy, um, even if it can only happen virtually. Teachers making amazing efforts to planning, plan a great start to the year. Yeah, lots of love to any teachers or educators who may be here on this call. Um, Martha, I see your question about donations. We'll be talking about that later on in the call. Uh, so don't worry about that for right now. Mutual aid, lots of mutual aid happening. Inspired to take Oren's uh, wise speech course and buy his book. 
Um, I'm assuming Oren will share more about uh, his other work that is happening throughout the call, more nature, ongoing global commitments to peace and nonviolence, dance to be free program for women in prisons. Oh, that sounds awesome. Um, we at East Point also do a lot of work in the prison system out here. So curious to hear more about that. The Racial Justice Act passed in California State Senate today. Oh, wow, thank you for that, Lily. I actually don't know about that. I'll have to look into it. Uh, courses with Oren, Life is Simpler. So lots of inspiring things happening as well in addition to all of the struggles. So it's about five past. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and turn off the chat right now. Um, just because with so many people chatting, it can sometimes be a little distracting. Uh, you should still be able to send chats to the hosts and the co-hosts, but uh, why don't we start, um, get started. I know a lot more people will be joining us a few minutes late, but I just wanna start by sharing my screen and, and sharing a few uh, tech things. So I'm assuming that by this point we're, you know, six months into shelter in place here in the United States. Everyone here is probably a Zoom expert by now and can probably give workshops on how to facilitate Zoom meetings. Um, but I just wanted to go through some very basics just in case there are some people that are newer to Zoom. Um, everyone should see this bar of your screen. And to mute and unmute yourself, you just need to click on the microphone button. And um, we have it right now so that uh, the host or one of us needs to invite you to unmute um, and then you'll be able to unmute just because there's so many people on the call. Uh, if your video is lagging, if you have a, a weaker internet connection um, and you're not able to hear us very well, sometimes if you turn off your video, um, that can help. So if you're having internet uh, connectivity issues, you can try that. Um, and we also wanna invite everyone to click on both the participants box and the chat box, which many of us have already been doing. Um, and, you know, we were all just chatting just now, so most of us are familiar, but uh, you can send chats to either Oren, myself, or to Chris. Um, Chris, if you can wave, uh, will be doing some tech support today. So throughout this entire call, um, we'll be doing a questions and answer period at the end of the call. So if you have questions for Oren, if you can go ahead and find Chris's name in the, uh, where it says, the, the little box where it says select Chris, just click on Chris's name and send him your questions and he'll be compiling them. And we'll be using that as a way to engage in a dialogue with Oren at the end. So at any point throughout this call, if you have questions for Oren, feel free to send them to Chris. You're also able to rename yourself by clicking on your name and just clicking uh, rename. I wanna invite everyone to have your name and maybe where you're calling from. And finally, just so everyone knows, uh, as I shared, this call will be recorded. Um, and the recording for this call will be shared with everyone as well as it going up on our uh, YouTube page. So if you do ask a question or if there's an opportunity for you to come off of mute and engage in a dialogue, just know that your call is being recorded. Um, if there's any part of the call that you'd like us to edit out at the end, um, you can contact us later and we'll be happy to do that as well. Um, so I think that's all for tech stuff. So with that, uh, I want to officially welcome people again. Uh, my name is Kazu Haga. I'm a core member of the East Point Peace Academy. We're an organization based out here in the San Francisco Bay Area um, in California. And we're about seven years old and we've been doing workshops and trainings on peacemaking, nonviolence, restorative justice for a long time. Uh, and we do a lot of work in the prison system. Uh, we have teams of nonviolence trainers in several different prisons throughout California. And more and more, we're shifting our gears into becoming uh, more than just a training organization and really a community of practice where we're engaged in, in practicing uh, the, the practices and principles of nonviolence in the world, particularly at the intersection of climate change and racial healing. And since COVID hit, we've been doing the series called Where Do We Go From Here? where we've had amazing speakers um, share their thoughts on everything from uh, nonviolent campaign and civil disobedience to doing prison re-entry work in the time of COVID. Um, and today we're uh, really excited and honored to have Oren J. Sofer um, for this call. And you know, I, to be completely transparent, I haven't known Oren for a long time. Uh, it's not like we have a 20 year relationship, 
but just in the short time that I've been able to connect with him, um, there's been a few things that has become very clear about him, who he is, and his work in the world. I think the first thing is that the work that he's doing and the message that he's putting out there in the world is deeply needed, um, as evidenced by the fact that we have close to 400 people on the call, um, and as evidenced by the fact that when we launched this event about two weeks ago, we actually had over 1,500 people register for this. So I'm assuming a lot more people will join throughout and will be watching the recording. But also just his, his humility and his generosity, um, his generosity with his teachings, with his time, uh, with his commitment and, and, and his desire to, to kind of reach out to us and share his wisdom with us at East Point and, and really find ways to collaborate. And it, and it feels very obvious in the short amount of time that we've known each other that we are very much kindred spirits and are looking forward to a much longer relationship with him. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Oren is a meditation and nonviolent communication teacher who has practiced meditation in various Buddhist traditions since 1997. Uh, and he began his study in Bodh Gaya, India, which is where the Buddha was enlightened. He's a graduate of the IMS Spirit Rock Vipassana teacher training and a current member of the Spirit Rock Teacher Council. He's also the author of Say What You Mean, A Mindful Approach to Nonviolent Communication, a practical guidebook for having more effective, satisfying conversations. He's also the co-author of two books on teaching mindfulness to teens and adolescents, the Mindful Schools Curriculum for Adolescents and Teaching Mindfulness to Empower Teens. Warren first became interested in contemplative practices in high school where he picked up a little book called The Tao of Pooh by Benjamin Hopp, which by the way is also my like life-changing book that I read when I was 17. He went on to complete a, a degree in comparative religion from Columbia University and later spent two and a half years of living as an anagarika or a renunciate at branch monasteries of the Ajahn Chah Thai forest lineage. Today he teaches, uh, his teachings combine classical Buddhist training with the accessible language of secular mindfulness. So again, we're extremely grateful to have Oren uh, with us tonight. And so with that, I will hand the mic to you. Thanks so much, Kazu. It's, uh, as I was saying beforehand, it's, it's really an honor to be here with you and Chris and East Point and this community. I just have so much respect and gratitude for the work you guys are doing in the world. So it's a real pleasure to be here. And I want to add my welcome to all of you. Um, looking forward to spending some time together this evening and exploring this moment that we are living through. I want to begin by inviting you um, to notice the earth beneath you and to notice that through your body, if you like, as the places where your body touches the ground and to begin by acknowledging the earth and the land where each of us happens to be right now. First and foremost, for the care and the nourishment that this planet gives us every day. None of us would be here. We wouldn't be able to exist without this incredible planet and its immense generosity with our species. I also want to acknowledge the First Nation peoples that have stewarded the land lived in relationship to it for generations here on Ohlone land in California, wherever it is that you find yourself and really offer the deepest respect and honor to those peoples that are still struggling for sovereignty here in Ohlone territory in California, across North America and throughout much of the world. So we're here to explore this theme this evening of, of ending the war within and, and looking at these various tools or frameworks of spirituality, nonviolent communication. What do these have to contribute to the predicament we find ourselves in? And I'm so grateful uh, that Kazu started us off earlier with this invitation to share what's inspiring, what's nourishing, what are we celebrating in our life? 
And I don't know about you, but it's been a rough year. It just feels like one impact after another, after another. And it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed. It's easy to feel, start to feel numb. And recollecting and turning towards and taking time to celebrate the beauty, the goodness, that which is nourishing us, I find to be an essential part of any whole spiritual practice as well as any effective form of activism or engagement with the world. Because we need to be able to meet and metabolize the pain. And this is really what I want to explore with you this evening. So my thinking, just to kind of give you a little bit of a framework, um, I'll share some reflections for 25, maybe 30 minutes. Uh, then I'll offer a guided meditation trying to weave together some of the themes that I'll present. Then we'll hear a little bit again from Kazu about East Point and this event. And then we'll have some time at the end for questions, dialogue, and mutual exploration. So I love the title of this series that East Point Peace Academy has been putting on, Where Do We Go From Here? It's a profound question, right? How are we oriented? What is our vision for the future? One of the things that I've learned through my own practice, study, my own life, uh, the teachers that I've been fortunate enough to study with, both in the Buddhist world as well as in the discipline of nonviolent communication, Marshall Rosenberg, Mickey Kashtan, the late Inbal Kashtan, is that first and foremost, the place that we go is actually here. That, that we have this tendency as human beings to leave the present in search of something else. And that there is this very um, kind of exquisite and subtle balance between vision, aspiration, having a sense of what's possible for us, as individuals, as a community, as a species, and a sense of being deeply rooted in the present with a quality of relationship that mirrors the vision of what we want to create in the world. So where do we go from here? I think for me, on one level, I don't know. Right? That's the truth. None of us knows what's coming, and there are many ideas and directions and strategies. But one thing that I do know is that it needs to start by going inside, by being here more deeply, and by connecting with the reality of what's happening. Another thing that's clear to me is that the problems that we are facing today, the the wide range of challenges from the climate crisis to the health crisis to the moral crisis of the reckoning with the racial injustice and violence of history on this land in the United States to the economic crisis uh, to the breakdown of civic discourse, the erosion of community, um, the challenges to the very fabric of democracy here in the West. Uh, around the world in many, in many places, that all of these problems are interconnected. That they're not separate. That they're manifestations of something that begins in the human heart and mind. So many years ago, um, Kazu mentioned that I started my meditation practice in India. I was quite fortunate to be able to, as part of my undergraduate work, to go abroad and spend six months in Mother India, as it's known, and to study the Dharma in the land that it was born. And I did my first 10-day Vipassana meditation retreat there in Bodh Gaya at the Thai temple. And one of the teachers there, Christopher Titmus, uh, told a story that really went deeply into my heart about Mahagosananda, uh, who, if you have not heard of him, he was like the Mahatma Gandhi of Cambodia. He's a Buddhist monk. Uh, who walked around during the Civil War 
in Cambodia as the war was raging, as uh, people were being killed in mass numbers. And he would go uh, to people's homes and knock on the doors and speak to the families and say, tell your sons to put down the rifles and kill the hate in their heart. He understood the relationship between the violence and the war that was happening outside in the world and the forces in our own mind. Many years later, he was in Washington, D.C. I think this was in the 80s demonstrating uh, against landmines as part of a coalition that was demanding that nations around the world abandon the use of landmines, which even after the war ended in Cambodia continued to wreak havoc and blow people apart because there were so many landmines planted in the ground. And one of the things he said, apparently, at uh, at this demonstration the landmines and the anti-personnel mines in the ground started in our hearts. If we want to remove the landmines from the earth, we have to first remove the landmines from our own hearts. So there's this deep understanding that comes out of many spiritual and mystical traditions, religious traditions around the world, that the roots of violence that are expressed interpersonally, relationally, collectively, begin in the human heart and mind. And one of the things that is so uh, overwhelming, I think, for, for me, certainly for many of us, confusing and difficult, is that those roots of fear, hatred, ignorance, othering, domination, control that feed violence have become institutionalized in the structures of our society. Uh, The Slovenian philosopher uh, Slavoj Zizek wrote, systemic violence is the often catastrophic consequences of the smooth functioning of our economic and political systems. So we, we are living in a time where the roots of those violence have become divorced in many ways from personal responsibility and action on the collective level, where we see economies, criminal justice systems, uh, healthcare systems, destroying communities. We see the, the, Victor Lewis was on, uh, was sharing with the community several weeks ago about uh, capital and the operation of capital and how the very mechanisms of our economic system, right, kind of perpetuate and institutionalize the forces of greed and are disconnected from real human needs. So all this to say that the interconnectedness of the problems that we're facing means that the response needs to be an integrated response. We have to integrate empathy, love, and compassion with an understanding of history, with political strategy. We need to integrate um, a fierce protection of those who have the least in our world with methods for dialogue and engagement with those who are in positions of power who are perpetuating harm. A response that can integrate an understanding of the past with a vision for the future and a new story And the work that, that I feel very passionate about today and that I you know, feel like is the, the, the edge of my own development and practice is how do we integrate spirituality with action? How do we integrate personal healing, this commitment in, in Kingian nonviolence to self-purification commitment with social action and social change? Because what I've seen in my own life, uh, if we look at history, we see that spirituality without engagement, without action, can devolve into self-centeredness. We lose touch with where we come from, with our responsibility. And the inverse, action and engagement without some form of spirituality, 
without some source to draw from, is at, it's at best unsustainable. But at worst, it ends up consciously, unconsciously recreating the same dynamics of oppression and control and domination that we're seeking to transform. So what is spirituality? It's a big word, right? What do, what do I mean by that? Um, my partner works in palliative care medicine. She meets with chronically ill and dying patients and their families to support them with their spiritual needs. And the definition that's used in palliative care that really speaks to me is spirituality is that which connects us with something larger than ourselves. And I hope you get a sense of how broad that can be, right? From meaning to purpose to ancestors to the divine to, the, to the, the biosphere and the ecosystem, to love, to a deep commitment to non-harming, to vision, to a sense of connection with future generations. This, this, is, our, this is our birthright. This is our potential as human beings. That we have, that awareness has the capacity to see beyond the, the very narrow window of self through which we often experience the world. So what is the war within? This phrase, ending the war within. Well, to what degree are we in conflict with ourselves? And to what degree are we in conflict with life, with reality? How do we relate to other people's behaviors in our personal relationships when they're doing things that we don't enjoy? You know, I don't know about you, but if I'm not careful with my mind, I just, it just plays over the same thing again and again and again, and the same argument, and the same points. Right? Fighting with who? Where are they? I'm feeding those seeds of conflict in my own mind and heart or aspects of ourself that we reject. Yeah. yeah. For me, part of my my own journey has been learning to share more of myself, more of my heart, my vulnerability, to not hide behind a degree or a role or being able to give a nice talk and string some words together. Uh, pretending that I'm okay, that my heart doesn't break every single day with what's happening all around us. I mean, the amount of suffering is intolerable. It's more than the personality can hold. It's not something that, that, that our individual mind can grasp. How do we relate to the parts of ourselves that are challenging, that we feel ashamed of, that we'd rather really not be there, or that we prefer others didn't see? Are we in conflict with those? To what extent do we override our boundaries, push beyond healthy limits? So there's this way that we can be at war internally with ourselves, with our relationships, with our own aspirations. There's a very powerful quote from Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk and mystic who, was, um, who studied Gandhi, who was deeply connected to the movement for nonviolence um, that many of you I'm sure have heard. He, he said, the rush and pressure of modern life are a form, perhaps the most common form of innate violence to allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit oneself to too many projects, to want to help everyone and everything is to succumb to violence. The frenzy of the activist neutralizes their work for peace. It destroys the inner capacity for peace. It destroys the fruitfulness of one's own work because it kills the inner root of wisdom, which makes life fruitful. And there is this, this principle that I have been learning about from 
from Kazu's wonderful book, Healing Resistance, that I love, that is becoming very well-worn in my possession, um, of avoiding internal violence of the spirit as well as external violence in Kingian nonviolence. So part of the war within is a sense of being in conflict with what is. There's a beautiful quote from Byron Katie who said, when you argue with, re with reality, you lose, but only 100% of the time. So my sense is that it, it can be easier to see how coming to peace inside with the way things are is helpful, makes sense, brings relief, um, is healthy on an individual or on a personal level. Though when we take that teaching, right, of non-conflict, of coming to peace with the way things are, and we start looking at it on a social level in relation to injustice, to the climate crisis, to oppression, to poverty, it starts to, it doesn't make as much sense, right? It's like, how do I accept things that I don't agree with? What does that actually mean? It doesn't mean that we acquiesce, that we stand by or allow ourselves to be complicit. Right, there's this um, understanding of, of relativity there's a very famous um, interchange between, um, I'm forgetting their names, it was two white men at the time of the, the, the Scopes trial around evolution, teaching evolution in schools in the United States. And one of them said to the other, um, per perhaps it is you who have moved by standing still. Right? So all motion is relative. And so when we are living within a system or multiple systems that are creating harm, non-action is not neutral. To not respond is actually com supporting the perpetuation of harm. And yet, so there, there, there can be a way that we're still at war internally with reality in relation to what's happening around us, where we're not at peace, we're not actually embodying nonviolence or the relationship, the vision of beloved community that we wish to create. So ending the war within to me is, is, is brings me in to this question, which is kind of a koan. A koan is a, in, um, in Chan and Zen Buddhism, it's a question that can't be answered with the logical mind. A question that, that we're meant to live into. That's meant to draw our consciousness and awareness out beyond the boundaries of what is comfortable and familiar. And to, to create the conditions for a shift in how we understand and relate to being here. So the, the question that ending the war within, how do we end the war within? The question that brings me into is, how do I relate to the injustice, to the oppression, to the harm, to the danger that we're facing today? And so I see in myself, I see around me, on the one hand, there are these extremes. We can deny it. We can, we can avoid it, pretend it's not there. We can spin a narrative of everything's getting better, we're moving in the right direction, and in some way actually not, not engage or fully open to the reality of what's happening. On the other hand, we can, fall into, we can fall into defeat or despair or cynicism. We actually do turn towards the reality, but we're not able to stay present with it and engage. We're not able to meet it. We actually become flooded or subsumed by it. And then there's another uh, kind of vector, which I think we also see a lot, which is, I refuse to accept this. And so this is what, this is what I kind of want to tease apart here. What does it mean to refuse to accept 
the conditions of our world and still embody peace and nonviolence. To not support or stand idly by, but also to not feed the seeds of war inside. So there's, there's a difference between the response of refusing to accept something, even being angry about it, that's a defense. That's a defense against feeling the pain or the grief or the loss or allowing ourselves to mourn the reality of what is. And, and the capacity to actually be fully in touch with what's happening. A refusal to accept it as the only possibility, but a willingness to come to terms with it as the current reality, to open our heart to the truth of what is. And, and this approach of being able to, to meet the reality, this is the first step to any transformation. We have to be able to acknowledge and fully face the problem before we can work to change it. And so th this meeting the reality of what is, there can still be anger that has wisdom in it that sees clearly what's happening and that that energy can be channeled into a wise response, into action, rather than, rather than this tendency to fight with reality, which is another form of inner violence and kind of tragically and ironically can recreate the very same dynamics of domination and oppression. It's a kind of control. Right? We, in the heart, we exert a force to try to control things to get what we want. And this is, this is the disease of the mind, to not allow ourselves to be in the flow of life, which doesn't mean we can't act, which doesn't mean we can't influence things, but it means that we are deeply and intimately connected to and aware of the actual conditions that are unfolding within and around us. And my, my, my deep belief and experience is that the war within can't be ended by winning it. It has to be healed. And so the, the, the strategies of control, of force, of domination don't work. They recreate the same dynamic. Whereas the energies of love, awareness, balance, these have the, the property of, of integrating and metabolizing the roots of violence as well as the grief and the pain and the anger and the outrage and the fear and the overwhelm, all that is attendant around our relationship with what's happening. So th this is the difference between a kind of sober and clear-eyed acknowledgement and reckoning with the reality of our current moment and some kind of spiritual bypassing where I'm accepting the way things are, which is just kind of a capitulation to the status quo. So we can be deeply connected and acknowledge the reality of what is while still working for change. And it, and it is that capacity, that very capacity to open to what is and to be in touch with all that it evokes in us that allows our work to be sustainable. Again, from Thomas Merton, don't depend on the hope of results. You might have to face the fact that your work will be apparently worthless and may achieve no result at all or even results opposite to what you expect. 
as you get used to this idea, you start more and more to concentrate not on the results, but on the value, the rightness, the truth of what you do for itself. Can you sense the place that he's speaking from? There's this very profound relationship with reality. There's a very clear sense of action, vision about what needs to be done without that energy of control, without the war. So part of the framework for this uh, exploration this evening is looking at the resources of spirituality, nonviolent communication in this This, this process, this um, kind of deep engagement with ending the war within. So I already mentioned spirituality as anything that connects us with something larger than ourselves. What's nonviolent communication? Uh, for those of you who are, are new to that term or NVC, um, it's not just a communication technique. A colleague of mine, Kit Miller, said, nonviolent communication is an awareness discipline masquerading as a communication technique. It's a system of training our minds and hearts to relate to ourselves, other people, and the world in a way that empowers us, that helps us to see one another's humanity and makes it easier to work together. And at the heart of it, at the core of it, is a particular way of seeing. And we can train ourselves to see the underlying fundamental needs behind others' actions. And it's based on a premise that as human beings, we have more in common than we do that separates us. And that part of what we have in common is that we want to be happy, that we long to be fulfilled. And that what that looks like are these different facets of the human heart. We want safety. We want our kids to have education. We need health care. We want to play. We want to be creative. We long for community, celebration, meaning, purpose, contact, love, joy, beauty. These kind of incredible qualities that we have the capacity for as human beings. Relationally, spiritually, we have more than our basic needs for food, water, shelter. We have all of these other needs. And that if we can see past the views, the opinions, the actions, however misguided or harmful, we can get to something that's deeper. So NVC teaches us to, to live in this way, to see from this perspective, and then to have that translate into our words. It's like a linguistic Aikido that helps us to, to respond and relate to others' behaviors and words from a place that doesn't take on the energy of war, that allows us to come from a different perspective. And so that, that is rooted in that, that, that practice of a certain perspective, a certain way of relating, a way of listening and speaking, is rooted in spirituality. It's rooted in a sense of being connected to something larger than ourselves. Maybe that's a commitment to non-harming, a deep sense of, of ethical awareness, the vulnerability of life. It might be rooted in empathy. Dr. Rosenberg, Marshall Rosenberg, the founder of nonviolent communication, often talked about the divine energy. For him, he used a kind of theistic framework to explain it. The divine energy within each of us that can express itself as compassion and generosity. Again, that we have the capacity as human beings to access compassion in the face of suffering. And instead of responding to pain with avoidance, denial, despair, anger, domination, reactivity, we have the capacity to stay steady, to meet it, and to meet it with tenderness, to see what can I do to help. 
And then this kind of energy of generosity and, and compassion comes through us. It's not personal. Right? It's something larger than us. And all of this, all of this work that I've been talking about, it needs to be rooted in what Kazu started with this evening. It needs to be rooted in resilience, in joy, in community, in connection, in resource. Because it's heavy and it's hard <laughs> and it's larger than our lifetime, you know? We're, we're hopefully building something that will outlast us. And so we need nourishment, we need food for that. So my friends, those are some of the thoughts that I wanted to share with you this evening. Thank you for your your patience and kind attention. I wish I were able to be in a room with you so I could feel what it feels like where you are right now. So I, I thought I could lead us in a short guided meditation uh, to kind of explore this, this sense of how do we meet what's happening. And what I'd like to do is to have, have three parts to the meditation, and I want to just kind of frame it first so you have a sense of where we're going, and then you can kind of navigate a little bit along with me. So first we'll just kind of settle and arrive, just using the body, the breath, whatever's helpful for you. Then we'll touch into something that's uplifting, really starting from that place of resource and resilience and joy. So. You know, the Kazu and I didn't plan this, but a lot of you, have, you already planted the seed of something that you're celebrating, that you find inspiring. So we'll call that to mind and get some of the nourishment from it. Then we'll bring to mind something that we're struggling with, personally, interpersonally, collectively, and allow the heart to be with it, opening to the possibility of mourning, of grieving, of anger, whatever's there, um, like my friend and colleague Mickey Kashtan uh, wrote in one article, mourning, the, the capacity we have to mourn is nature's tool for helping us to metabolize the gap between what we long for and what is. So we'll have some time to do that. To be in that gap between what we value and long for and what is, and to let the heart do what it needs to do. And if you get overwhelmed, if it's hard, if you start struggling, you go back to the nourishment. You go back to that resource and gather yourself. And then we'll have a little time to just explore the balance between those two. And then we'll close. Okay. So before we start, if you want maybe to just take a moment to look away from the screen, just give your eyes a rest. If you want to just for 30 seconds, give your body a little movement, a stretch. So I invite you to find a comfortable position to sit or stand or recline, whatever is supportive for your body right now. And in your own time, just begin to turn your attention inwards. You can close your eyes if that's supportive, or you can just kind of gaze down at the ground in front of you, just letting your gaze be soft and unfocused. I often like to take a couple of deep breaths at the, peri at the beginning of any period of contemplative practice. And so we're gathering the attention and bringing the mind and the body into the same place at the same time, just with the simplicity of being fully conscious 
of your own body's posture. So whether you're standing or sitting or lying down, see if you can let your attention begin to rest in your body. You might feel your breath or your hands, just the overall sense of being embodied. Where do we go from here? Well, are we actually here first? So arriving. And you might notice the places where your body touches the ground. And just feeling the steadiness, the support of the earth. See if you can let some of your muscles and tissues soften and relax. Giving your weight to gravity. And perhaps noticing your breathing, just that gentle, easy rhythm. If your breath's uncomfortable for any reason, you can just rest your attention with your hands or the sounds around you. And bringing to mind something that inspires you, something you're celebrating that nourishes you. And think of a specific moment, the moment you got that news. The actual moment you saw that friend or felt that breeze. And try to let that moment become as clear and real in your mind's eye as possible. Moment of inspiration, nourishment or joy. And as it begins to take shape, notice how you feel. Notice if anything relaxes or opens inside. If there's any sense of ease or pleasure or relief, however subtle or small. See if you can begin to let it in. Just lingering here, receiving. Letting your cells take it in, let your whole being be immersed in that flavor of celebration or inspiration. Breathing, holding the image, and just sensing, receiving any echoes. Any effects of this moment. And then when you're 
ready in your own time, you can let that begin to fade, just kind of dissolving into the background. And then bring to mind some condition, moment, or situation that you're struggling with. You're not at peace. There's that sense of a war within. It's difficult to accept, to come to terms with, personally, interpersonally, collectively. See if you can hone in on a specific moment, not just the theoretical general sense of it, but an actual data point in your life where you got some news, you heard something someone said or did, you felt that impact. And now watch the tendency to go into the center of what's difficult. I encourage you instead to just kind of hang back. You might feel your feet or your hands, just the overall sense of your body. It's enough to just kind of be aware of this challenge without needing to dive into the center of it. And what's it like to make space for whatever comes up? Even if what comes up is numb, blank, frozen. Seeing if you can bring a quality of tender, patient awareness. This is how we end the war within, one moment at a time. We love it to death. So there's this sense of this challenge or situation, whether it's an image, a word, or an idea. Sensing your heart, how the body and mind respond. And seeing if you can bring a warm and caring attention just to this moment. What if it were okay to feel exactly how you feel right now? If there's sadness, grief, or mourning, just making space for that. And if it starts to feel like too much, and you back away. Bring to mind that bright moment. Take a break, get a little nourishment. So be quiet for a couple more minutes and just let you explore holding both of these in your awareness the challenging or struggle, that part and the nourishing part and just see where it goes.
feeling the earth beneath you. Bringing a kind attention to whatever's happening. Thank you so much, Oren, for um, all of that wisdom and for that practice. And I want to share um, yeah, a little bit about one of the practices that we are engaged in at East Point. Um, this is actually not a conversation about money, even though it may feel like it. Um, for us, it is a conversation about uh, relationship and the kinds of principles and practices that guide us as an organization. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen one more time here and share a little bit about um, a set of principles and practices that we call the gift economy. Um, as an organization, the East Point Peace Academy operates on the gift economy. And that means many things. Um, among them, it means that over the last seven or eight years that we've been around, we've had probably 13,000 people come through our door for various programs, and we've never charged a single dime um, to anybody. There's a, a teacher that talks a lot about the gift economy, Nipun Mehta, who says that in a market capitalist economy, the fundamental assumption on the core nature of humankind is that we are creatures that are after self-interest. And so if you build an economic system that nurtures that, that cultivates that, then we'll all thrive. But in a gift economy, the fundamental assumption on the core nature of humankind is that we are creatures that actually want to give. That when we are practicing generosity, that's when we become our fullest selves. And so the gift economy is about inviting everybody into a system of generosity. So we offer all of our programming without charging anything as a gift to the world and to anyone who comes through our doors. Because when we're able to make an offering and make a gift like that, it makes us feel good. And so in that same kind of uh, light of generosity, Oren has donated his time. And so any income that we make um, from this workshop, 100% of that will come to East Point because that is his gift to us, to our support our work as well as to the world. And that's what makes him happy. And so I uh, want to offer that invitation to everyone on this call as well um, and invite you all into this kind of reciprocal system of generosity. Um, the principles of the gift economy, again, means many things. Uh, for East Point, it means that we try to practice these seven principles. Uh, we're not going to have time to go through each of them. Uh, but this is a system that's not just about making sure that everyone can come to our workshops, but it's really about changing the paradigm of how we view things like relationship and money and resources um, and access. One of those principles is the practice of transparency. Um, so if you do choose to give to support our work, just so you know a little bit about what you're supporting. Um, as an organization last year, we spent about $120,000 um, and we reached over a thousand participants across six states. Um, and as you can see, the vast majority of our funding comes from individuals and not from foundations. Um, and as also as an ongoing practice of transparency, I just want to share that we recently received um, a, a grant from a foundation. Uh, it's a three year grant of $100,000 a year, um, which is incredible and also comes completely out of relationship. Um, this is a foundation that because we know the people there and they trust us. They said, you know, send us two pages and we'll give you $300,000. And so this is also something that like, it's not a, a foundation that we just applied to out of nowhere. 
um, it all happened through relationship um, and happened within the gift economy. And so I wanted to share that as well. And ultimately the work that you would be supporting goes to these communities. Um, again, about half of our work go, uh, happens with incarcerated communities. We have teams of nonviolence trainers uh, throughout prisons and county jails in California. We also have programs for the community. Um, one of the programs is this Where Do We Go From Here series. And our next uh, offering, which will be in two weeks, is with Leonie Smith, who's also a nonviolent communication teacher. Um, and we know that nonviolence is a set of principles and practices that brings liberation to everybody as human beings. Um, and also because of so many misunderstandings about what nonviolence is, what nonviolent communication is, um, it's not always accessible to marginalized communities. And so Leonie Smith, uh, for, as a black woman of Jamaican descent, will speak from that perspective about how nonviolent communication can be liberatory for all people. Um, and also, uh, I shared at the beginning that as an organization, we're shifting from an organization that's just doing tra uh, trainings to being an organization that's actually engaged in practice. Uh, we're starting to mobilize people and to prepare people to respond to the upcoming November elections here in, in, uh, in the United States uh, and really grounding in nonviolence and spiritual practice as we engage in direct action. Uh, so if you do decide to support our work, that's a little bit of what you'd be supporting. And we're super inspired by this quote from Marsha Rosenberg, who started Nonviolent Communication, where he says that giving is done out of, when giving is done out of pure joy, you can't tell who the giver is and who the recipient is. So I'd love for all of you to look at this image and to just ask yourself the question, who's receiving more joy out of this interaction? And it's that question that we want to, to have guide you in terms of, do you want to support our work? And what is the right amount? And if you do feel called to support our work, if you feel like supporting our work would give you joy, um, we'll email this link uh, in, the, in your follow-up email, and we'll also post it in the chat as well. You can go to eastpointpeace.org backslash Oren donate, um, and you can give one time, or you can set up a monthly donation, which actually is a much better way to help sustain our work. So we do ask that if you, you know, are considering giving $50 for this event, if you can consider signing up as a monthly donor for $5 a month, that's actually much more helpful for us. Um, and so whatever you're able to give, even if it's not money, even if it's prayers and well wishes for our work, um, we're deeply grateful to all of you for that. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and excuse me one second here. And share the link in the chat box uh, if people are feeling called to give. Oh, and Oren just did that as well. So thank you. So thank you all and thank you, Oren. And we'll now begin to transition into a question and answer period. We have about 20 minutes. And so again, if you have questions for Oren, you can go ahead and send a private chat message to Chris um, in the chat box. And as we kind of have questions coming into Chris, I wanna start Oren with a question that I had about um, one of the kind of conflicts and tensions that I'm holding, the war that is raging in my heart, is this balance of feeling a deep sense of urgency in this moment, of feeling like the world is on fire, and in California it literally is, but also knowing that the work of healing takes slowness. And so that tension of the urgency of the moment and knowing that we need to move through it slow is a struggle that I think a lot of people are having and would love to get your wisdom on, on, on that war. I bow to your question. <laughs> yeah, beautifully put, Kazu. I think there, 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 there are two things that come up for me in response, um, maybe three. I think, I think the first is, I think that that question itself is a koan, right? It's like, holding the question of how do I move from a place of presence, deep connection to what is, and patience in the face of urgent need? Like, right, like that's not a question we can answer with our mind. So I think that there's something about 
holding the question and in some ways even finding like better and better ways to ask the question that can bring us into the response. That's, that's the first piece that comes for me. The second piece is, I, I just have this sense of like the mosaic of engagement that is happening and needs to happen, right? How each of us has a different role. You guys talk a lot about vocation and nonviolence. Like each of us has, that, has a different way of engaging. And so, um, you know, Joanna Macy has a model of the different kind of quadrants or sectors of social action and there's triage, right? There's like taking the babies out of the river. Then there's those who are going upstream to find out who keeps putting babies. And so there's some sense of like an innate trust that I don't have to do everything and, and, and widening the view or the perspective beyond what it is that I am called to do and the urgency that's needed. That's another piece for me. I think the third piece is kind of, you know, my, my own lived experience of what you're talking about is being able to open to the, the dysregulation in my own nervous system of the urgency. Like when I come to sit in the morning and do my practice, um, these days there's, off, there's often a sense of being rattled. And, and it's, it's again, it's a sense of allowing that to be there for whatever that period of time is that I'm practicing helps me to metabolize it some so that I'm not acting from that energy. And it's just like a willingness to meet it and be with it. I don't know how much that answers the question, but uh, that's, that's what, what comes for me and how I relate to it. Thank you so much for that. Um, we are starting to see some questions trickle in and I also see a couple of hands. So we'll start with this question. Um, how do you recommend getting started with nonviolent communication? I've heard mixed reviews of it as a modality. So if someone's wanting to get started with the practice as brand sure, new. Sure, great, great question. So let's take the mixed reviews first. Uh, there's good reason for it having mixed reviews because a lot of people don't understand it and misuse it. And the, probably the number one misuse is see, mistaking the form for the spirit. So nonviolent communication has this form, and I'm sure Leonie will speak about this in a couple of weeks of when I, you know, what I see and hear, how I feel, why, what I need, and what I'd like to have happen next. Observation, feeling, need, request. If you relate to that as a, as a contemplation and a way of transforming how you are relating to and thinking about the situation, rather than as a script, a lot of the problems will disappear. <laughs> it's when we hold rigidly to it as a script that is one of the main challenges. So that's the first thing I would suggest that you bear in mind about it. There are other nuances, particularly when we start looking at issues of power and privilege, which Leone will unpack uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, otherwise, good way to get involved, to just get started, um, take a class or a workshop. Um, online, bayNVC.org has, has groups. Um, I'll put that in the chat. You can check out Marshall Rosenberg's, Marshall Rosenberg's seminal book, Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life. It's a great introduction. It's short, clear, powerful. Um, you can check out my book, Say What You Mean, A Mindful Approach to Nonviolent Communication. It's a little bit longer, more thorough. Um, and this might be an opportunity to also mention, I have an online course coming up. It's a three month training in mindful communication, integrating mindfulness, nonviolent communication, and some nervous system work from Peter Levine. And we go through my book one chapter at a time, one week at a time. So it's a very kind of systematic training if anyone is interested in that. And I'll, I'll put the link for that in the chat as well. That sounds awesome. You and, and Peter will be make a, an amazing team. So I'm interested in that. Um, I see a hand from Anne Marie. And then I also saw a hand from, um, I think it was Athena that went up and then went down. So go ahead and feel free to raise your hand again if you'd like. But I'll, uh, Anne Marie, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi. Um, I don't have a question. Um, I just wanted to say that I 
in my chat box it says chat disabled and i'm just wondering if that's preventing people from posting questions yeah thank you for that um it's actually uh what it the chat should be disabled except to send chats directly to one of the co-hosts so myself oren or chris so if you there should you should be able to click on the blue button that says everyone and then find chris and send a chat message to chris um, but for if, if that's not working, go ahead and, and raise your hand. Um, you can do that by clicking the participants button and then clicking the raise your hand button and we can just call on you. So thank you for that, Emory. I was actually wondering if something was wrong with the chat. Um, I just saw another hand go up very briefly and then come back down. So if you do have a question, if you wanna go ahead and raise your hand and just um, keep your hand there until I call on you. So I see a hand from Doug. So Doug, go ahead. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Oren, um, I was wondering if, if you might talk a little bit about the difference between um, sort of being able to, to manage the sort of intimacy and nonviolent communication uh, with a friend or relative, sort of being able to find that capacity of heartfulness to, to put aside the differences and just want to connect that way, but almost overcompensating for that is the system at large, is the crowd at large, is that that what you described earlier about sort of feeling rattled and overwhelmed by the enormity of all the challenges. And I feel like there's a tendency for me anyway to sort of direct all of that that anger and righteous indignation and frustration out at the masses who are doing this and saying this. So there's a bit of a disconnect for me. I feel like my practice has grounded me in a greater degree of intimacy with those in my circle that I'm in contact with, but those out there, it becomes much more challenging to, to, to ground myself in compassion in that regard. Hope I that see. makes sense. Yeah, let me just say it back and tell me if I'm getting it, Doug. It's like how, how, to, how to integrate or hold what sounds like a disconnect between the level of intimacy, connection, and warmth you feel with those in your immediate circle and kind of the rest of the world, it seems to be going mad. And this uh, there's a tendency to um, see others as others, to not be able to connect as much with warmth. Yeah, it's almost like it's easy for, for me to sort of judge the strangers out there, even though friends and relatives might have the same beliefs, the same values, the same thoughts. I can put those aside yeah. and passionately abide with them, but it's much right. more challenging now. Great. With, you know, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. I really appreciate it because I think that that, again, that question is so much at the heart of what we're seeing today, right? Is that how do we relate to the stranger? How do we relate to that, to those who appear to be other to us, whether we're looking at issues of race, gender identity, um, sexual orientation, citizenship, immigration status, so we see that dynamic playing out politically in the public sphere on multiple levels where um, we've gone from the foundation of the Judeo-Christian value of welcoming the stranger to um, the stranger as not only other but enemy is the narrative that's, that's promoted today. So on an individual level in our own heart, um, again, the first step, which I just wanna acknowledge is the, is the recognition of the pattern, right? Is, is the recognition of what's happening in our own heart and seeing it. Then for me, the next step is to allow yourself to feel what that feels like. I think we're often very quick to skip over whatever the struggle is to, I want to fix this, whether it's, okay, I'm going to do metta practice, I'm going to do loving kindness practice, I'll do compassion practice, I'll do NBC empathy. We're, we're ready to kind of jump in and fix it or attend to it, um, which if we do that so quickly, my sense is that we end up um, actually papering over it rather than transforming the roots of it. So the first step I would encourage once you're aware of that tendency is allow yourself to fully experience what that's like. How does it feel to see 
people in your community, people on the news, people in other towns um, as so different and, and other? Like, what is the experience on the felt level of that? I know for myself, when I do that, I feel isolated. There's a quality of disconnection, um, either fear or anger. Uh, there's essentially a, a kind of suffering or, or not being fully at ease inside. So I would, I would first really investigate and open to that experience so that you're, you're able to meet it, not from an intellectual idea, but from the actual experience of it. Um, then from there, there's various antidotes that you can apply. It's possible that by going into the pain of it, it will, it will transform itself. If not, then you can use some of the other methods that I mentioned, whether it's compassion meditation and think of a specific individual, get the image of someone or a name from the news and, you know, tune into their suffering, imagine their life or loving kindness meditation or appreciative joy. These are very powerful practices that come out of the Buddhist tradition that help open the heart with empathy to the joys and sorrows of other people. Um, you can also use um, the process of NVC empathy where you uh, try to identify the other person's feelings and needs. How do they feel about whatever is happening? What's important to them? What value are they holding at a deep level that I share? And so it's, it's a process of training ourselves to see, not just with the eye, but with the heart in a different way and to connect with the person's humanity. And, and my understanding is that this is really part of what's at the, at the root of the work of nonviolence is to see the goodness and the humanity in another person. And that's a training. Uh, Kazu talks a lot in his book about sh Shugyo. Am I pronouncing it right, Kazu? Yeah, shugyo, it's, it's, a, it's like a martial art. It's, it's something that we work at slowly and diligently and patiently over time so that the heart learns how to shift the perspective to connect with that aspect of another being at a different level. Thanks, Doug. Hope that's helpful. Yeah, see, we've got a few more hands. Yeah, let's hear from uh, Sabrina Mahmood. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you may have just answered it. I love the um, the linguistic aikido that you described as the spirit of NBC. And so my question really was, and I've been practicing NBC for a while. So my question um, is, how do you access that spirit? And do you need to have a spirituality practice to really be able to be in that? linguistic uh, Aikido's spirituality of NBC. Thank mm. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. So how do we access that and do we need a spiritual practice to be able to do it? Um, loving both of your questions. I don't think we need a spiritual practice because I don't want to get caught up in semantics. I think that my view is that we are spiritual beings regardless. And when we're not in touch with that, something in us starts to atrophy or die or just kind of get frozen. It's still there, but it's just not accessed or expressing itself. So um, I don't think we need to call it or think of it as a spiritual practice to still be drawing from some source or, or inspiration that's larger than ourself. Um, how do we access it? Again, it's, it's, for me, it's about training. Um, and there are different ways. There are different ways in. You can just look at someone. If, if, we really, if we really look and see someone, and I, I'm aware I'm using visual metaphor here, and not everyone is sighted, um, or if we feel into their presence, something in the heart opens. You know, look at the lines on their face. We're all growing old. We all get sick. 
So uh, this is, my sense is that this is not something we need to work to create. It's rather we, ha we apply our energy and attention to return to a way of seeing and being that is more innate. And the energy and the effort that we make is actually the energy and the effort to um, to shift our our consciousness and our, our way of relating out of the of the habits that have formed through the socialization process, our life experiences, how we've been conditioned, the wounds and injuries we've sustained to something that's more fundamental. And so, you know, using your, your senses, your eyes, your body, um, holding a question in your mind, the NVC, the core NVC practice is what matters? What matters to this person? What's important to them? And then there are other meditations you can do contemplating this person aging, growing sick or dying, contemplate them playing with a kitten or a puppy, uh, giving flowers to their loved one, right? right? You, look, you look for those sparks of humanity that are there instead of seeing the mental image that we have created of them and fixed or frozen in time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Oren, and thank you, Sabrina. So we have just five minutes left. So I'm thinking maybe we have time for one more question. And um, Oren, if you want to respond to that question, and then if you want to just offer us any closing words that you might have right after that. Um, and then after that, I'm actually going to invite everybody to unmute and we'll just shower you with our gratitude. So um, I see a, a question from Ilka. So Ilka, why don't you go ahead and ask the last question? And I apologize to those that we couldn't get to. Hi there, can you hear me all right? Yep. Hello. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you might be able to speak more on, um, first, thank you so much for your generosity, before I forget, for doing this, appreciate it. Um, a collective mourning and how to possibly be as present as possible, first, I mean, obviously on an individual level, but still take care of oneself uh, or how to integrate equanimity with experiencing that. Mm. Say, say another few words what you mean by collective mourning. Okay. Um, possibly, possibly by like just seeing it on the news and then I'm possibly being swept away in thoughts, but you know, just going through one's experience and, and, and seeing that mirror in people around you. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, are, are you asking like, how do we stay balanced and not get consumed by the mourning and the grief when, it, when we start to open to not just our own, but the, the grief and mourning of others? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it takes balance. Um, there's a part of me that thinks there's something important about allowing ourselves to become, to just open to the flood. It's a fine line. It's a fine line between really being, you know, crushed or overwhelmed where it's actually not useful. We just, we just end up dysregulated and not trying to control too much the emotion that we're feeling. It's like the difference between a really good cry where afterwards you, you feel lighter and something's complete and, mm -hmm. and a kind of crying where we're actually spinning and we just feel exhausted and kind of um, frayed afterwards and nothing's actually different or resolved. And in my own experience, it, it takes time to start to get a, a sense of where that line is and, and in a felt way. <clears throat> internally. Um, so what I'm saying here, I think, is 
know your tendency, know if your tendency is to go into the emotions and really get lost, or if your tendency is to hold it together more and be willing to experiment by going in the opposite direction a little bit. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, a second is regulate by shifting your attention. So open your awareness, look around, go to sounds, ground in your body. There, there are ways to not get consumed if you are going in that direction. Choose where you put your attention and come out of the experience into the sensory, sensory reality. And then the third thing is, um, I think ritual is very powerful, whether that's individual ritual or collective ritual. But I think as a, as a society, the dominant culture has lost the value for ritual and we're suffering from this. There's a, a sense of deep poverty, I think, spiritually in the lack of honoring the role of ritual for healing, transition, um, co collective vision and aspiration. And so um, I would, if, you, if you're not, I would encourage you to explore that as a possibility for engaging with mourning. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, my friends. Um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for showing up, uh, for being willing to engage with these questions. Stay strong. Uh, don't neglect nourishing yourself. This is a time when um, the planet and our communities need all of us to really be here. And we can't pour from an empty cup. We can't respond if we ourselves are sinking. And that doesn't mean we need to be perfect in order to engage, but it means we have to attend to both. And maybe the last thing is don't do it alone. We're meant to be here together. So uh, I'm delighted to connect with you and be on the journey together. And uh, as I said before, I, I'm celebrating that uh, Kazu and Chris and Astrid and the East Point Peace Academy exists. And uh, I hope we can all find ways to participate in this wonderful ex experiment and new vision of, of sharing and collaborating through gifts and that you can find ways to plug in and support it. Take care, everyone. And thank you, Kazu. Thank you, Chris, for the invitation. Thank you so much, Oren, for all of your wisdom. And thank you to everyone who is on the call with us and will be watching this recording. Um, everyone will receive a follow-up email with some additional resources, um, as well as a link to the video once that is available. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, make it so that everyone can unmute themselves. So let's all 300 of us unmute and just shower Oren with our gratitude. And we will close with that. So. Um, go ahead and unmute me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Kazu. Blessings to you all. Thank you, Kazu. Thank you, Kazu. Nice to 